So good morning, good and morning. welcome to another Tuesday morning in the Word. And here at IEC, we have been talking for the last several weeks about transformation. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. And maybe you've heard some of what I have to say before. It's not new, but I believe these two verses are key. Key to living the Christian life. They're absolutely um, key. What else can I say? So I'm going to read those two verses, and then we'll talk about it. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when we look at verse 1 of chapter 12, the first word that we see is therefore. And so we want to know what the therefore is there for. <laughs> and so we look at the whole book of Romans up until this point that Paul has written. And we see what he's talking about. The first, the first part of Romans talks about the depravity of the human condition, our sinfulness, that we are utterly hopeless in the state that we're in. And there's nothing that we can do about it. Then he talks about even the struggle that he, he himself has had when he wants to do the right thing, but he can't. There's something that, that just won't allow him to do what, what, he, what he wants to do. That, that sin that has gripped the human condition, the human heart. And then he goes on to talk about what God has done for us. He has freed us from sin. He has come and given us hope. We were under the wrath of God, but because of his mercy, because of his grace, he has freed us from that, that we might live, that we might be free, that we might be redeemed and we might be saved. And so therefore I urge you, Paul says, in light of all of this, in light of God's mercy, you need to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the acceptable form of worship. And so we might think, what does this mean? What does it mean to present our bodies? Present, present what it's saying is present everything. Everything, your whole being. And when you think about it, all right, what do we do with our eyes? We've offered our eyes up to God, so what we look at is important. We offer up our hands, our hands, what we do is unto God. Where our feet take us is where God is bringing us and directing us to go. Our hearts, our mouth, what we say, what we speak, everything, we're offering it up to God. Offering up to God. Now Paul is saying this, and Paul is telling us that is the key to living the Christian life. Up to now, up to Romans 12, he's talked about our condition and what God has done for us. Now he's, he's urging, and the word urge is ju not just a suggestion. It's saying, this is imperative. You must do this in order to live the Christian life. Lay your life down so that you can live for Christ. Paul knew this well. You look at his life and you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he gives all of these hardships and trials and tribulations that he goes through, shipwrecks and beatings and prison and all of those things. I often wonder, and maybe you have too, how did he endure that? How did he possibly keep on going with all that he went through, all of the opposition? How did he do it? It had to have been that he had a revelation of the hopelessness of God of his life without Christ. And he says these words, he says um, in Philippians, he says, I, I count everything else as loss. It's all garbage to gain Christ. Everything else is worthless. But knowing Christ, living for Christ, he saw the human condition and knew that he had to give his life for the sake of the gospel that others might have that hope that he has found. And we, as believers in Jesus, we, when we come to salvation, we know 
our condition, our sinful condition, or we wouldn't get saved. But I believe that we don't know fully what Paul knew. Or we would, we would be able to endure more than we do. Right? Now we come to the second part, or the second verse, and it says, do not be conformed to this world. And that's talking about the world system. We're born into it. It's not just that we're, we're living differently. We're born into this world system. Everything that we see around us, everything that we're, we're hearing, is contrary to the purposes of God. It's a world system. It's a world system we have to break free of because the world will try to conform us and press us into its ways. But we know that God has said his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. We have to go, we're going actually, when we're living for Christ, we're going against the, the grain. We're going in opposition to everything else around us. And whoever God calls, he calls them out. In fact, the church, that's what we are, the called out ones. We're called to live a life different than the world system that we're in. We're called to be people that go against the grain. And so we feel the pressure. We feel the, the pull in how we think and what we do and how we live. And so now, how do we, how do we live the way God wants us to? And how do we not conform to the world system? Paul was motivated, motivated by love for Christ. Love for Christ. Love is what motivates him. He says he's compelled by love to preach the good news. Compelled by the love for God. Now, when we think about being called out, like I was speaking about in the church, we're talking about like Abraham, like Daniel, like Joseph. God called Abraham out of where he was, out of the culture that he lived in, out of the place that he was at, to a different place that God called him to. Everything that he knew, he left behind. The same with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were all called out of where they were from to this pagan place. But they had the ability, because they had a revelation of who God is, they were able to say no to the things of that culture that they were now found themselves in. So what I want to pray for us today, I want to pray for us that we will have a revelation of our hope and our calling in Christ. I want to pray that we will be able to see be able to see who God really is and the difference he makes in our life more than ever before because it's key to living for God. And so in, Revel in, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, this is what Paul prayed for the Ephesians. He prayed that they would have an enlightenment of their calling and he prayed that they would have a revelation of who God is, the God that we serve. And so let's pray. Let's pray and pray and ask God to give us that revelation. Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you that you have called us out, that you have called us by your name, that you have redeemed us, that you have set us free from the law of sin and death, that we can come to know you in a personal way. And so for every person that's watching today, Lord, that's listening today to these words, we pray, Father, that you will touch our hearts, that you will open our eyes to the truth, Lord, of who you are and what you have called us to, the utterly utter hopelessness that we are in apart from you. We pray, Father, this morning that, Lord, our eyes would be open and that, Father, that we would be able to relinquish it all, lay down our life, Lord, if need be, for the sake of your, of your, of your gospel, Father. So direct us and teach us and guide us, Lord. Open our understanding, Lord. Flood, flood it with light, Father. Give us the spirit of wisdom that, Father, that there would be a passion, that we would not be conformed to this world, but that we would be renewed, O oh God, and that we would understand and see the power of the gospel to change and transform us. And as we are changed and transformed, that we would be world changers, Father. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.